Hello, welcome to the Monday, October 9th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Singapore. With me in Singapore for the next two weeks, the podcast may be published sometimes at a little bit odd times of day, but I still should have a podcast once a day. First, I want to start out with a relatively new web browser API, and that's the Payment Handler API. The last draft was published October 4th, so late last week, and I think it's time to look at that API a little bit more closely. The basic idea of this API is to have a uniform way to deal with payments and with that also with stored credit card information, other payment information that's stored in the browser. Now, overall, this payment API actually does a couple of things quite nice and more secure than it's done in a traditional web application. In a traditional web application, the user enters their credit card information and that information is sent to the merchant and of course we have learned over the last years that this is very problematic given that you're sending the same data the same credit card number to multiple merchants if one of these merchants gets compromised then of course you have a problem that the credit card has to be replaced Of course, the number one reason why a merchant would implement something like a payment handler API is to make it easier and faster to check out. There are a lot of orders being lost or not being placed because the user can't find a credit card number or can't enter it. So as a result, we want to store it in the browser. But uh, while this may be a little bit problematic from a security point of view, what this payment handler API does right is that it no longer sends the payment card information to the merchant. Instead, uh, the payment card information is only sent to the processor. So the way this works is that the merchant does send the order details to the browser and then this JavaScript API is taking that order and taking the payment card information and sending it to a processor. The only thing sent to the merchant is then a confirmation that the order has been paid. Now, of course, the user has to confirm the order in the browser and has to allow this payment API to actually then conduct the payment. But overall, it's supposed to be a lot faster and simpler for the user to check out a particular order. Shipping and billing information can also be transmitted via this API. Now, some people may cringe a little bit at the idea of storing payment card data in the browser, but overall, that has been done reasonably safely in recent browser versions. The main problem that has been identified so far with this payment handler API is privacy. For example, a merchant can figure out uh, which particular payment methods you do support. So essentially, what type of cards do you have stored in your browser? Also, uh, the merchant may be able to distinguish between the incognito and the normal browser mode by using this uh, payment handler API. So right now you find this payment handler API in Microsoft Edge and in Google Chrome. Firefox, I believe, has it already built into the browser, but it's disabled by default and you have to explicitly enable it via a configuration change, but it should show up as a full supported API pretty shortly. Another advantage for the merchant in this particular case is also that the merchant never has to deal with the payment card information, so may not have to deal with a lot of the PCI issues and the like that can of course be quite expensive and labor intensive to deal with. So if you see it show up in browsers, that's really what it's all about. I don't see a big risk with it at this point and actually some advantages for the customer as well as for the merchant. And OpenSSH released version 7.6. Compared to version 7.5, there's one security issue that's being addressed here, and that's the fact that with SFTP, it was possible to create zero-length files 
even though SFTP was used in read-only mode. So I don't see this as a huge issue, but something that you may want to address, of course. What's kind of a little bit more important and probably you'll see more impact from is that SSH starts or OpenSSH starts phasing out a lot of the older ciphers, in particular as far as SSH1 is concerned. This can become a problem in particular with Internet of Things and the like that don't support any more modern ciphers. Also, short key lengths are being phased out in this latest version. I would recommend you keep an old version of the client around just in case that you have to connect to some of these devices uh, because even SSH with a not so great key or a not so current cipher is probably still better than connecting via Telnet. Ultimately, you want to update those devices, but of course, uh, that may not always be possible. And it looks like recently Microsoft uh, patched a couple of vulnerabilities in Windows 10 without actually announcing that they patch these vulnerabilities and also without releasing the same patch for older still supported versions of Windows like Windows 7 and 8. Google published an article about this as part of Project Zero. And of course, the problem with this is, and that's sort of where the uh, Google article is kind of pointing to, that by doing binary diffs of a new release of a particular library or software, you can actually figure out what possible patched bugs are and then write exploits for them, of course, for other operating systems if you notice that the same bug has not been patched for these other operating systems. With binary diffing like this, what it really means is that once you have a patch for one operating system, the vulnerability is known and can then be applied to other operating systems that have not yet received a patch, even though details about the vulnerability have not been officially announced. Well, and in Diaries on Friday, I put up a quick diary about the dangers of different types of cables. You probably already know that cable types like, for example, Thunderbolt does include their own little chipset and firmware, so that can possibly be used to attack the system. But more recently, also with USB-C, there have been issues with the cable providing the wrong voltage under some cases and actually leading to physical destruction of devices. And then and it's another example I put up some more traditional USB cables that contain additional functionalities like uh, little microphones, uh, GPS sensors, and uh, SIM cards with a GSM modem that can be used uh, to actually spy on a user that's using the particular cable. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.